Yes. Hey, David. Hi, Ron. Uh, one question I've got is the inflation-adjusted price of gold is $2,500, I think, today. Um, going back through history and back through time, do you have or is there data that plots the market price uh, versus the uh, inflation-adjusted price to see that it, it – does it ever correlate? Does it ever – hit that price or what I'm trying to do is to get some idea is what is that twenty five hundred dollars and is there um, I mean is there something that uh, that tells me <laughs> that it's a that it's a solid number I mean um, in in corporate America all corporations generally price or increase prices at least to the rate of inflation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and add premiums for any product modifications or efficiencies or anything like that Sure. Uh, is that? Am I off base, or is that a is, is that a, a reasonable request, or just looking to see if there is data? Yeah, there's a couple of things uh, to say. One, there's all kinds of data as it, as it uh, applies to what the Fed uses, the PCE. Um, that's their inflation number, or the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS, and to look at how inflation has changed through time. And set that against the gold price. Those are those are graphs that can certainly be drawn. Um, then comes the question: Is is that an adequate assumption in terms of the stated rate of inflation? Does it factor in what is actual inflation versus what is acceptable to report inflation? That's right. that's really what the CPI is: is the acceptable to inf report number. Um, so there, I mean, you have a whole range of numbers if you're using the CPI. You could be, let's say, eighteen hundred, nineteen hundred instead of twenty five hundred. Mm -hmm. If you use a more realistic uh, measure of inflation, um, the inflation used during the, the Clinton era, I think you come up with closer to a number of of twenty four, twenty six hundred, like the number you were suggesting. Um, John Williams' numbers have suggested that an inflation adjusted price, and he, with John Williams, he's with shadowstats.com, great resource. If you haven't read him, definitely spend some time at his website, get familiar. Might even be a subscription you consider, um, if, particularly if you, if you like analytics and, and statistics and things. Um, but as he calculates it, you come up with a gold price that's closer to five or six thousand. Real world inflation. Back up a little bit and look at 1980, where gold was peaking at 875. Um, factoring in sort of your official rates of inflation, priced for inflation, gold would have been priced for inflation at about 400. So it, it, it more than doubled its inflation adjusted price. It more than doubled its inflation-adjusted price. What, what, I mean, this is just my personal guidance, and, and because I already have a healthy gold and silver position, to be honest, I'm not interested in adding to my gold position once we get to an inflation-adjusted price. 2500 3000 3500 I'm, I'm moving to the sell side rather than the buy side uh, because now you're, you're, you're in an area where it, I don't think it's economically justifiable or sustainable. That's not to say it's not going higher. It's just you can't stay wherever it's going. It can't stay forever. Um, so, you know, to see your number twenty five hundred, to see it double as it did in nineteen eighty, and see a five thousand dollar gold price, um, it's possible. Um, Jim Rickards has 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 tried to sort of put together a price projection. Great book. Would encourage you to read it. Currency Wars, um, written earlier this year. Uh, or late last year, um, he'd say 6,700. That there's 6,000, 7,000 would would be would be sort of a low side estimate for gold, and could reasonably see higher numbers. Maybe try twice John Williams' inflation adjusted price of 6,000, which would put it closer to 12,000. I don't know. I mean, that that's really we're we're, we're talking about a moving target. Um, we'll look at where inflation is, where it's going, if it's increasing dramatically. If, if, if the dollar is being degraded, not on a slow, but on a more rapid basis, a super or hyperinflationary type trend, uh, where the, where the half-life is being cut uh, on a quicker and quicker basis, you know, we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we don't assume certain things as constants that aren't. Um, 
German mark gold traded in German mark terms at 180 marks and ultimately traded into the trillions. So price projections aren't really as relevant as, as, as people might seem to think. But definitely hold on to that inflation idea because I think it's, it's a reasonable guide in terms of when you're adding to positions and what ultimately is not sustainable. Uh, David, one final question. <clears throat> I'm hearing uh, in terms of global gold tons. Uh, some sources of the Gold Council, I think, is talking around 30,000 tons. The other, I'm hearing now, 165,000 tons. Are either of those numbers close? Uh, you mean you're talking about what what has been brought out of the earth? And yes, that that is in available. It's in distribution or in uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I think I think what you'd have to look at in terms of the difference of those numbers because they're they're pretty pretty. Yeah different between 30 and 165 is what is actually available because the number um, that I've counted on is about 171,000 tons of gold that's ever been available. And that's not to say what is available today. Some small fraction of that um, could be available at, at, at a price. Um, but your total gold supply ever mined and accounted for is about 171,000 tons. Um, Again, the, the the second question is how much of it is buried in, in, in a pharaoh's tomb that has yet to be uncovered or, you know, simply is not coming back because of industrial usage or um, there's nowhere near that amount available, which is probably what you were reading when, you're, when they were talking about a 30,000 ton number. Yeah, well, I'm trying to relate the 8,135 tons, I believe, 35.5 tons that allegedly the U.S. has in Fort Knox and uh, below the uh, New York Bank. Uh, yep. Yeah, and I think I think the 30,000 number you mentioned would 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 relate to, to what could be available at some price. Okay. All right. And 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 frankly. Um, I mean, I'd love to see if you see the article from from the WGC, the World Gold Council, on that. I'd, you know, send me a copy. I'd love to see it because um, I, I want I want to know if that eight thousand is included in the thirty thousand. Okay, we're new members, and I uh, we I thoroughly enjoyed tonight's discussions and questions, and uh, look forward to uh, um, some quality time with your firm. We appreciate it. John, thanks for joining us. Okay. Yes. David, I uh, want to commend you for staying on the line here for this one-hour uh, conversation. That's <laughs> extended. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a Jeff in Seattle, and I had some questions in regards to uh, equities. Um, I have since uh, been uh, selling some equities from that month uh, ago visit, which has been good. It's not hurt as bad because of that. But the question came up, and um, it, you, it, it's been a discussion point um, about uh, metals ETFs, uh, and a lot of times these ETFs, as you probably know, are uh, are paperback only, without any uh, any gold or silver behind them. And I'm wondering if that, to me, that seems like that's the big discrepancy between uh, the real price of, of gold and silver. Um, is if you go on trying to buy it, you got huge premiums. It seems like. Uh, because the uh, supply and demand is still operating in the marketplace, but because the uh, paper product ties it down. Um, do you see that being resolved anytime soon? Um, I, I guess two-point question. One, what's your advice on ETFs uh, relative to metals? And number two, that whole discrepancy between almost like two different markets, a paper market and a, uh, and a physical market. Great, Sean. Yeah, there's there's a couple of things that that are worth um, digging in, and maybe even going beyond what you're asking because that, that's that you've, you've raised some very interesting points. Um, so there's the ETFs which trade in, in the highest volumes um, do have metals backing them: GLD, SLV, uh, CEF, SGOL, um, PHYS. I mean, these these are these are uh, vehicles which were constructed to be proxies for the price, uh, and many of them, if not all of them, the largest and the most reputable, give you the option of taking physical delivery of the metal itself. Now, that's more appropriate for an institution, 
since you're talking about taking delivery of 400 ounce good delivery bars, and that takes some wherewithal if you want to take physical delivery of the metals. Um, we saw that happen in this recent sell-off in April. A number of institutions were not liquidating their ETF positions, but were calling for redemption. And there were um, there was a lot of tonnage that was delivered. Um, it, the metals were there. There was no problem. Uh, and and so, so, so no snafus. Everything went according to plan. Um, what, what I think someone should be cognizant of is that ETFs trade on an exchange. And so you have a proxy for the price. You have something that has been quote-unquote securitized, has a, a QCIP attached to it, and you can trade it like a stock. It happens to represent, in the case of GLD or SLV, one-tenth of, of an ounce. Uh, well, in the case of GLD, one-tenth of an ounce of gold. But... Um, and then there is there's there's gold sitting in a London vault backing it, but here's your limitations. So let's look at this this week as a classic case in point. You own GLD. The market in Sydney and Hong Kong is rotten. I can tell you this because I was up at 1:30 yesterday, and I was up. I mean, my day started very early on Thursday. <laughs> we were at the office at 2:30 in the morning. Um, both both me and a number of my colleagues. So what was interesting is GLD doesn't trade until the New York Stock Exchange opens, right? So you have this price decline in the overseas markets, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. We broke 1340, and then we broke 13. It just continues to cascade. There's absolutely nothing you can do owning GLD because you are tied to stock market hours. On the other hand, you know, if that had been a physical metal purchase and you wanted to liquidate ounces, uh, not a problem. Physical gold trades on exchanges all over the world almost 24 hours a day. And so, you know, hedging a position, um, selling a position, physical metals, it's not an issue. But you've just tied yourself to an exchange when you're trading an ETF. And so if there are limitations, either to the time frame at which you trade, um, you know, now, now you've, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. You, you cannot sell when you may want to sell in a pre-market hour. Um, so th- those are the kinds of limitations that I see with the ETFs. They're good trading vehicles, um, but they do come with some fuzz. They do come with some fuzz. You're counting on bank intermediaries. Uh, you're can- counting on Wall Street institutions. Um, and, and as such, you, you, you introduce counterparties into an asset that if you're just dealing in the physical market has no counterparties at all. So if for me, looking at gold as a growth asset, I'm happy to trade in an ETF. Looking at gold as an insurance policy, I wouldn't touch an ETF with a 10-foot pole. Why? Because the mandate is dramatically different. And when I deal with an insurance policy, an insurance product, do you know what I want? I want something with no counterparties, no additional risk. I want as much control and, and, as, and, and as much simplicity as possible. And that's what you get with the physical metals. So you, you do pay higher premiums for the physical metals, but what you're doing is, 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 you're, is you're imputing into that physical metal price all of the encumbrances and all of the inconveniences that come with moving something that's real. When you're dealing with an ETF, you don't you don't have to worry you don't have to worry about paying shipping on 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 delivery of the product it's it's just moving on the exchange it's 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 moving in the vault from someone else's pile to 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 the GLD custodian pile okay so it, you know it, you're you're not talking about shipping from one country to the next from one state to the next there's lots of things that go into the pricing of physical metals which increase their cost compared to 400 ounce good delivery bars which aren't, aren't aren't leaving the facility. So you gain efficiencies with the ETFs, you lose some safety in terms of introducing counterparties into the equation. The question is why do you own it? If you own it for growth, ETFs are great. If you own it for insurance, then I would suggest that you consider physical metals. And I was using it for like an equity position. Uh, I'm just I'm wondering in this environment, uh, 
that's as crazy as it is. Um, it, it's, it's not doing that for me. It's that uh, there's there's way too much risk, and you know, so I'm I'm beginning to liquidate that uh, those positions. But I'm also thinking uh, while you were talking that it is a position to be in in an overall long term market if you're trying to catch the market in in the metals and you don't want to gain possession of a physical product for whatever reason. Right. No, I, I totally agree. Totally agree. It, it's, it, it serves its function as a proxy for the price of metals. And, you know, again, usually what you'll find with someone sort of badgering the issue or saying we don't like them, they're not there, you'll usually find a retail gold operation on the other side somewhere, somehow. You know, there's, 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 there's a, a dog in the fight, so to say, um, a reason to increase criticism of the ETFs. You know, every year we, we continue to do our due diligence, and if they change the rules, if they change the perspectives, if they change how they're operating, uh, we, can, we can pull the plug on that kind of a position in a heartbeat. Um, so that's, uh, and, and there's, you know, again, all of the ETFs that, that I mentioned earlier, they all have slightly nuanced differences. Um, some of them are better uh, in terms of liquidity, some are, some are worse. And so I think, I think they're, they're very reasonable as a growth play, uh, as an insurance play, uh, you, you want as much control as possible. And I, just, I can't emphasize this enough. We are in no man's land. It, it, this, is, this is something that no one alive today has ever seen. You, 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 you may have been there and alive when the Bretton Woods Agreement was signed in, 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 in the hills of New Hampshire. You may have been alive. You may have even been aware of what was happening at that point. But we had, we had all the cards stacked in our favor. We had everything stacked in our favor. We made it through World War I and World War II, and our manufacturing capacity wasn't destroyed in the process. Our, our position in terms of global GDP only grew. The number of ounces of gold that we had surpassed anyone in the world by a large factor in 1944. And what is in play today is a complete reworking of the world monetary system. The dollar, 10 years from now, will not have the position that it has today. Maybe it's a shared position. Maybe it's a shared position with three or four or five other currencies. But it will not have the same position that it has today. And this, this is a revolution in finance. This is a revolution in asset values. And, and I think, I think to, to de-emphasize the insurance component is to miss the point. Your physical metals may be the only thing that you own in the future. I, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope that we're not sort of overplaying the point that you can have social instability on the basis of inflation. But this week, I mean, this week, Sean, there's a, this week started with 200,000 people on the streets in, 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 in Sao Paulo. Now there's a million people on the streets in Sao Paulo. And they don't like the fact that there's corruption. They don't like the fact that there's higher prices. They don't like the fact that they can't afford what they could afford in years past. Inflation is taking a bite. And it doesn't make sense that people should be going to the street on the basis of 20 centavos. This is a 20 cent increase in the price of bus fares. But, but you, this is the, what, we, what we underestimate and underappreciate is that the real ramifications of inflation are not monetary or economic in nature, but they're social and they're cultural. And, and, and what we're on the verge of is, is a transition to maybe you don't know your neighbor as well as you thought you did. Maybe your community is not as cohesive as, as, as you thought it was. Put them under a little pressure and what happens next? I hope the best of my neighbor. I hope the best of the community I live in. But I don't know what people do under desperate circumstances. And I think that's what we're moving towards. I know this moves beyond your question of ETFs, yeah. but there, there, there is a real reason to own real physical metals and right. keep it simple. There's a good reason to own physical metals and have them stored someplace else, but I think there is a real reason to have something in your hot little hand as well. David, do you think this, this whole bit of manipulation that is being played out here between the paper and the physical I mean, that's just the shell game that can only, uh, it can't last. I mean, no. and I like thinking that it's somewhere, it's the bubble's going to burst in, in a positive way for, for gold and silver. I mean, the reality is that's going to be seen as the total 
real currency, and other people are going to finally come to recognize that. And and I think at that point in time, it it, it does gain, um, you know, not arithmetic but geometric type value. Um, it just explodes. Sean, Sean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the the, the issue that we see, and 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 I mean, you're you're saying. I think we're going to see a move higher when the manipulation stops, when the shenanigans behind the scenes comes to an end. From my vantage point, we're on the cusp of that right now. I mean, when I mentioned the commercial interests, the commercial interests having the lowest short position since 2005, that's very significant because the commercials usually don't get it wrong. If, if, if they think there's going to be downside in the price, then they want to protect their margin. And, and they go ahead and lock in that margin by having ounces that are coming out of the ground on the one hand and a price that they've just locked in on the other, and that protects their margin. When they stop hedging, when they stop shorting the market, basically they're saying, why would we want to lock in these prices? We don't have enough margin to hedge. We think the prices are going higher from here. That's just on the commercial side. And then you've got the speculative shorts, over 115,000 contracts. We haven't seen a spike like that since 2008, before that since 2005, and each of the spikes in speculative short interest in gold preceded their unwind, which took gold anywhere from 60 to 80 percent higher on those moves, directly attributable to those short interest covering. And now we have the highest short interest that we've seen in decades. Where are we going next? Hey, listen, I don't like the fact that the gold, the gold price is down. I don't like it at all. I don't like the fact that the price of silver is down, except that I was able to buy some more this morning. And I do like that. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's yeah. abnormal that it's at these levels. And as, normal, as, as abnormal as it is, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take advantage of that. When you look at the market dynamics, the speculative interest, the commercial interest, the short interest, etc., you, you've got everything lining up in your favor, not for three years from now, not with a resurgent trend in gold and silver five years from now, some new commodity bull market 20 years from now, but in the next several months, in the next several months, I mean, we're, we are in this 2013 to 2014 time frame, uh, I think sitting on a powder keg. Again, I mean, if you said, are we going to gain traction in the next two days, 20 days, 60 days, I don't have a crystal ball. I, but honestly, I don't care. I, I hope, there's a part of me, and, and I hope you, this doesn't sound sick, but I hope the price goes lower. I hope the price goes lower. Because I still have ounces that I'd like to buy. Now, I don't hope that for you. I don't hope that for your portfolio values. I don't hope that for your monthly statement or your quarterly statement. But I do hope that if you have any greenback sitting there, a wheelbarrow full of cash, that you look at it and you answer that question. Which would you rather have? the wheelbarrow full of cash or small box of gold coins or silver bars. And if that's the case, then you're being given the opportunity with premiums being put into the dollar today, greenbacks, to move out of a premium inflated asset into something that is devalued and cheap. That's a, that's a great value proposition. Good answer, David. I appreciate it. Thanks, Sean. All right, thanks. Yeah, David, first of all, I want to say how much I appreciate the weekly commentary on your dad's investment advisor. Um, my question is, uh, with respect to, I know how to buy gold. I called up today to your company and bought some, some gold and silver. But I'm so naive, and you talk about exit strategy, I don't know how to sell gold. So you just give me a real quick heads up about that. My other question was, with respect to the perspective triangle, which I paid a lot of interest to, where in the context of that triangle do your illiquid assets, like your real estate, or as a health care provider, I have a practice in 866 in the next five to seven years, I may be interested in selling it. Just the commercial real estate value and the equipment is worth something. Where do those uh, assets, with respect to my total worth, fit into the triangle? Okay. Great, great questions, Marvin. I mean, a couple of things. Um, when you go to liquidate the metals, you're talking about logistics, and y you either have let someone else deal with the logistics or you're dealing with them. So if you store them in, say, our Toronto program or store them in our Zurich program, then liquidation is a phone call away. Um, they're in a location where if you wanted to go to Toronto and get them, you can. They're physically there. Uh, you know, just let us know, and you can actually go by and pick them up. 
if you don't choose to do that, if you choose to just liquidate them through the company, then it's as easy as a phone call. That means that you've put the logistics on someone else, and you're paying a fee for that, storage fees for the logistics to be covered. It's a cheaper proposition for you to take physical delivery of the metals. It means that the logistics are on your shoulders when it comes time to sell, which is just packaging it up in an appropriate sealed box, taking it to the U.S. Post Office, sending it registered and insured through the post office. They won't insure more than $25,000 worth of product. Not a problem today. In a hyperinflationary environment, that might be an ounce of silver. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, today, under normal circumstances, $25,000 per package, and you'll need that many boxes to send product back to us. Um, that's that, that's one, Once we've received the product, it's a live product that we can, we can take an action on. Do you want to wait a week? Do you want to wait two weeks? Do you want to go ahead and liquidate the product on the spot? Um, that, that's, that's the process. So fairly straightforward process in terms of the liquidation. Um, in regards to the perspective triangle, we look at the perspective triangle as a, a sort of the back of the napkin asset allocation model, not intended to be sophisticated, just to help you organize the major themes of what your money is doing for you. On the right-hand side of the triangle, it's liquidity. On the left-hand side of the triangle, it's growth and income. On the bottom of the triangle, it's insurance. So you've got these general mandates, and they may have lots of different assets associated or compatible or appropriate to those particular mandates. Um, when, when, we, when we look at the per perspective triangle, we're really talking about assets that you can tactically do something with. That's why it applies more to liquid assets, and it doesn't include private business interests, business practices, uh, commercial real estate, and whatnot, mainly because those are not things that you can be tactical with. If you wanted to sell uh, your property, if you're lucky, you could sell it in a day. If you're unlucky, it might take you a few years. That's not something you can really count on to be tactically engaged with. So when you look at the perspective triangle, think of that as your liquid assets. Um, if you want to transition, and, and you know, just in generic terms, you're talking about a third in growth and income, a third in cash, a third in the insurance component, which, which we consider to be precious metals. If you want to look at your total net worth, including the illiquids, then as a rule of thumb, you should shoot for 10%. That's, 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 I think, a reasonable number in terms of net worth, particularly if you're pretty heavy on the real estate side and business interest side. What that means is that your perspective triangle may have a flatter bottom. May have, you know, in other words, it's, it's, it's going to be an isosceles triangle instead of an equilateral triangle because you have more gold, more than a third, on the assumption that there are considerable assets that you're hedging on the illiquid side. But 10%, I think, is a pretty good rule of thumb or one-third of liquid assets. 10% of total net worth or one-third of liquid assets. That, that is sort of the insurance mandate. Different, different ones of our clients have decided they want that number to be higher. That's totally your prerogative. Um, but, I, but I think as a rule of thumb, one-third of liquid or 10% of total, total net worth. Very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome.